would have been a very quiet Facebook live. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so as far as I know, it's just connecting now. Good. Um, Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure we're live. Hopefully. Um, just waiting for someone, anyone out there in the ether to confirm um, that we're live. But if not, I think we will just crack ahead and go for it. Really? Sounds good. Right. So brilliant i've got the go ahead um we are live so thank you very much for everyone for joining us for our clinical audit awareness week facebook live event try saying that 10 times fast um tonight we've got a great group of people um all associated with rcbs knowledge um in some way and i'll just remind everyone um about us about rcbs knowledge we are the charity partner of the rcbs and our mission is to advance the quality of veterinary care for the benefit of animals, the public and society. Um, so I'm gonna go around and get everyone to introduce themselves. Um, I will start off with Pam, if you could introduce yourself to everyone. Thanks Amelia, my name's Pam Mosdale. Um, I'm a vet, I'm um, QI clinical lead at RCVS Knowledge and chair of RCVS Knowledge Quality Improvement Advisory Board. Um, I got involved in audit a long time ago, actually, when I was in, because I've always been involved with practice standards. And when I was involved with the Veterinary Hospitals Association, we were trying to look for ways to try and judge what practices, um, what actually happens in practices rather than just um, bits of kit and buildings. So we thought, what's this audit thing they do in the medical world then? And started having a look at it. Um, and I wrote an article about it then. And it's gradually, um, improved and I've always kept um, very interested in clinical audit because, uh, and quality improvement generally because I think it's a really important thing for teams to be doing. That's me. Angie, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, hi, I'm Angie Rayner. Um, I'm CVS Director of Quality Improvement and um, also on RCVS Knowledge's QI Advisory Board. And um, yeah, so I was introduced to clinical audit again through the practice standards scheme and um, well, yeah, introduced to quality improvement um, via the PSS and, and then it just um, blossomed from there really. And so uh, recently did a, a master's in patient safety and clinical human factors. And of course, clinical audit really features high, you know, uh, highly in that program. So, so now we do a lot of stuff at CVS and we're working um, with some clinical audit tools at RCVS Knowledge as well looking at antibiotic use, which is up and coming. <laughs> and Amanda? Nothing. Thank you, Amelia. Yeah, and thank you for inviting me. Very excited to be here. And following on from Pam and Angie is some big shoes. But <laughs> um, so I'm an RVN. Um, I've recently just moved from clinical practice over into becoming a VN educator. Um, so I um, work with foundation degree students and also diploma students in a college in South Wales. Um, I just have a big passion for QI. Um, it's something that happened recently. I've been to a couple of Pam's talks at BBNA um, Congress before, and it just from there, yeah, just absolutely love it. I've written an article on how to conduct clinical audits for the veterinary nurse. I gave two lectures at BBNA Congress this year um, around wound management and how we can use QI to improve our wound management standards and also on infection control. Um, and I recently have started an Instagram page um, called the QI Veterinary Nurse or the QI RVN, um, just trying to promote QI out to um, other RVNs and other veterinary professionals. Brilliant. And if you've watched one of these before, you probably know who I am. Um, my name's Amelia. I am an RVN by trade, but I've been working at RCVS Knowledge for the last couple of years, um, starting off as project officer for quality improvement. And now I'm a quality improvement project manager responsible for national audits and registries um, and kind of everything all over um, and in between. So we've got a brilliant bunch of people um, 
kind of like a, a brain power here for clinical audits. Um, <laughs> um, an absolute A-team um, and our Agony Aunt Pam. Um, so we're all here to answer your questions um, about audits. Nothing too big, nothing too small. We'll pretty much answer everything. Um, but to start off with, um, Pam, do you want to give us a bit of an introduction to kind of clinical audit as a I don't know, imagine I know nothing about clinical audits and I'm coming to you just going, oh, what is it? What do I do? <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose I ought to change my name to one beginning with A, really, shouldn't I? But <laughs> my middle name is Anne, so we can, we can oh, use that. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, so yeah, clinical audit. Well, well, first of all, I tell you what the definition is, a little bit dry, but is something you need to know right at the beginning of all this. And it's a process for monitoring and assessing clinical care with the view to identify an action, any areas for improvement. So in other words, it's about measuring what you do and then doing something about it if you find for that area needs to change and needs to improve. You may, of course, measure what you do and find out you're doing fantastically well, in which case you can celebrate. Um, why do we need to measure what we do? Well, if you think about a practice, maybe with eight vets and 10 nurses, and I go along and I say to them, um, how, many, um, how many anesthetics deaths have we had in the last year? And they say, everybody in the practice talked to individually says one. But so is that one they've all seen, or is that actually 18 different? Um, you know, so it, you need to have a, a, a way to measure what's happening in the practice. And if you do that, you can then know what, what you need to improve in the practice. And we all need to move along all the time and improve. If we stand still, we move backwards. So there's always things in the practice and, and they don't have to be big things or huge projects. They can be small little things you decide in the practice you'd like to look at and see how you could improve it. So um, I, um, like Amanda, I do some teaching of veterinary nurses in, in a course at Glasgow and they're always very enthusiastic about, um, about audit. And I think nurses drive audit forward very, very well in practices. Um, so, yeah, I think, and, the, and if you say, what can I audit? Well, basically anything that's measurable, anything that's relevant, anything that um, happens often enough. Now, the anaesthetic death example I gave is a really poor example because hopefully it happens so infrequently that you're gonna wait so long to measure it. You need something that happens all the time, happens frequently, because then you're gonna get some data pretty quickly. And I always thought that the really important thing was measuring the data. But now I think the really, really important thing is discussing it with the team when you've measured the data and deciding what the barriers were to getting to the level that you wanted to be. So it's choose a subject, choose, make, go a little bit more into it and make sure you've got, um, you've chosen the, the exact criteria. So, you know, if you're talking about um, go to audit um, whether your estimates on consent forms for um, procedures. Well, are you going to audit all for all procedures or is it that you decide, well, actually we think the routine ops are fine. We're just going to audit, for, audit it for non-routine procedures, but you need to define that. And like anything else in life, planning is the key and spending lots and lots of time planning it and discussing it with your team is, is vitally important. And then once you have got your um, subject and you, you nailed it down to a very um, small definite area, then it's a matter of um, deciding if you, you, there might be a standard. I mean, if it was something to do with um, legal, legality, like maybe controlled drug um, audit, then the standard would be 100%. But generally, you might not have a standard. So you just make yourself a target or you do an audit first and use an improvement on that as your target. And then the other major thing I would say is get the team on board right from the beginning and be totally transparent because if the team know what's going on, then they're not, they're going to, even if they're not going to join in, as long as they know what's going on, that's the important thing. If you do audit without the rest of the team knowing, it can feel a bit like Big Brother looking over your shoulder if you're not careful. So, um, yeah, I think that, um, and, and you can audit, as I say, lots of different things. You can audit outcomes of procedures. You can audit how you comply with processes. You can audit structure, like a, a vet's car boot and what sort of bits of kit they've got if you're in a, a mixed practice. So lots of different things you can audit. I think that's um, that's a couple of the questions that are coming in. It's always about um, how do you pick your area to audit? What do you audit to start off with? And I know the first audit that I did um, was quite simply what patients with IVs in ended up having phlebitis. Um, just because at each handover that we had, 
um, it was like, oh, that cat's got phlebitis. Oh, aren't we having a load of cats with phlebitis? And, you know, it would start off with a bit of a, I don't know, you just start gossiping about it, really. And you'd just be like, oh, well, you know, I had a cat last night. And it didn't have phlebitis. So it must be something that someone else is doing. And it causes a really horrible environment for you to just do anything with because then everyone's staring at you putting IVs in thinking you know is that is that what they're doing that's causing it so we started an audit um just basically to see if we had a problem or whether it was just these cats just happened to have phlebitis and they would have done with anyway and that really took away kind of all the all the whispering and the gossiping that happened because once we looked at our results we were just like well yeah some of them some of them have phlebitis, but quite often there'd be cats that spent their whole time in the kennel kind of hunched up and they'd get fat feet. And, you know, there was there's nothing that's going to stop that because if a cat just doesn't want to be there, he doesn't want to be there. And um, so that was the first the first topic that we did just really came to us on a handover one day. And um, Angie, I know you've done a lot, um, well, quite a large audit with controlled controlled drugs, um, which obviously Pam said your target would be would be a hundred percent do you want to tell us a bit about how that started about how on earth you got involved with that and what our target actually was <laughs> what your target actually was yes, I, know, I think that's really was. important because yeah yeah exactly it's important to yeah to um have a an appropriate target for sure so yeah we looked at um within the organization we looked at um you know, controlled drugs recording, yeah, and uh, any sort of variances between what was written down in the register and what was actually in the in the and in, in the drugs cabinet. So um, we did that across the organization, and and you know, and it really started because when you you know when you're in visiting practices, um, you know, and and preparing practices, helping them prepare for practice standards, um, you know, you'd go and visit uh, the the controlled drugs cabinet and you're like hmm you know this um we need to sort of look at things you know look at our processes here so we can we can um make sure we're meeting all of the legal requirements as far as recording and things like that and and um and that our variances are are low and and so and the more practices that we visited we're like okay like right let's let's focus on this now uh because we see that people need support in this area and and certainly you know uh, the the goal was we need to know where our control drugs are at yeah we need to be able to track this stuff not only for um complying with our medicines res- regulations but also for people's well-being yeah. you know because that's really like the biggest reason you know uh with with our um suicide rate in in the profession and um you know potential drug abuse it's really important that if something goes missing that we know about it very quickly so so we can can get support where it's needed really and so so that's how it all started and um you know so we put processes in place to do sort of a, a yearly audit and um, where practices reported their, you know, their purchases, their use, uh, their waste, uh, and you know, they're beginning and ending balances. And and um, and our goal was to have less than a ten percent variance, which is, uh, I think, what the VMD says we're allowed to have. <laughs> so 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 yeah. So the first year um, we had, I can't remember what the variances were act, uh, off the top of my head. Um, but you can look in the, um, our CVSQI report and equally, um, uh, we did, uh, I apply, uh, applied for a knowledge award as well. So you can find the, the applet, my, my case study on the RCS knowledge, um, website and read more about it. But, um, the variances, the variance in the first year, um, was pretty high. <laughs> it was pretty high uh above the allowed variance if i remember correctly and um and we're like okay right so now let's see what are all the factors that contribute to why this is the case yeah and so um and so really then we started addressing all those factors where it's things like okay well we don't really have a good controlled drugs register you know to really be able to track this stuff so we designed our own and made sure every practice had it. Um, and we made sure that uh, there was uh, an SOP 
for controlled drugs, what to do if there's a variance, what to do if things, things go missing, um, and really sort of um, educated everyone about what are the requirements here, and um, looked at things like um, controlled, controlled drugs cabinets, do they meet the requirements, are we storing our keys safely, um, and, and so on and so forth. So we made all of these improvements and in, in the next, and equally we put in heads of dispensary in our practices and we trained them on what they need to do, what, you know, to meet these requirements. Um, because there was, and, and Pam Mosdale was a big part of that. Yeah, yeah, she, she helped train all of, our, all of our heads of dispensary. So, so yes, yeah, so it was a real team effort and ev like the whole, organization really got behind it. And I think that was so important in our success because the next year really um, just the variance was like, I don't know, 4% or something, you know, and it was just really low. And, and it was something we really celebrated and everyone was so proud of, you know, and, uh, and everyone gets behind and which is really helpful with this in the success of any clinical audit is that everyone believes in it, you know, and, and the purpose behind it and they all get behind it. So, so yeah, so it's really exciting. And now we, we do it every year. Um, last year we didn't for obvious reasons, but um, we're, we're implementing it again this year um, just to try and get back on track <laughs> after the, the almost two years we've had. And yeah, so. I feel get... like nothing's really existed in the past two years. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the twilight zone. Lovely good reason why to do it isn't it because to get the um to celebrate when you, you know when you do that re-audit and, and you haven't finished doing an audit if you just do one if you just audit something once you've got to do a re-audit otherwise you haven't actually finished your clinical audit but when you do that re-audit after making your changes and and things have improved your team can celebrate that's so yes. positive really 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 positive and you know, you know and you have to decide are you keeping these changes and if Mm -hmm. made the kind of improvement that Angie's have then we well, will be keeping them you might find with other changes you made maybe in changing one thing something else in the practice has gone a little bit out of kilter mm -hmm. so um in which case you might have to adapt them or you have if they haven't made any difference and obviously you wouldn't carry on but um yeah no I think that um positive effect on the team is brilliant yeah so we've got a great question um that's come in that was actually thinking about asking too was disappeared um yeah that's it so how do you manage the conversation with the team if the results are worse than you anticipated or expected um because i know especially in the past especially when it comes to controlled drugs the minute someone says these results aren't as good you automatically get on the defensive like it was busy how can i ex be expected to fill in a logbook and <laughs> make sure it's on there and make sure it's on here and yeah um and i know it's in you know we all get results that aren't what we expect but how do you approach that with your team and keep them motivated and inspired to do better when actually what you're saying is that we haven't done very well Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's a matter of finding out what's happened, right, with the team. Okay, team, here's our results, right? Now let's find out why we have the results that we do. Yeah, what's happened? What, what about our systems and processes gave us this result? Yeah, and so it, um, it's about the team... Um, discovering what the, the barriers or the blockers or the challenges um, to what we're trying to accomplish and, and then identifying solutions on how to overcome them together. Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, so that's how I would approach it. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with you, Angie. I think um, we, you've got to listen to the people on the ground who actually do the job because it's no point some, some senior manager or clinical director or even head nurse deciding um, how, what the problem was. It's got to be the people who actually do the job because they, senior people don't know how the people really do it and how they really do it rather than how they think they do it. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Amanda? Yeah, I agree. And I think it's the language that you use and you speak to people as well. And we started in a practice I previously worked and we had started auditing our 
clinical drugs um, for our controlled drugs. And we found that unfortunately there was quite a lot of repeat offenders. And I think that's where it then gets difficult because you're not wanting to single people out. You don't want it to be that kind of pointing fingers and blaming people. You kind of want it to be like, how do we do this as a team and how do we bring people forward? So we kind of got over that by doing one-on-one -on -one training with everybody so that everybody was at the same level. Everybody knew kind of what they were supposed to be doing. And then if you need to kind of almost go back in and retrain again with certain people, then it doesn't feel like you've kind of singled them out initially. Um, so I think that's important as well as kind of not pointing fingers at people. Yeah, I think that's really important that any training you do as a result of an audit, it's got to be for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And they've got to believe in the reason why you're doing it. Yeah. 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 They have to really believe in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And Angie, I like what you said that you had um, heads of dispensaries. Um, so you kind of empowered your team to take that responsibility. We've we've had someone else say that they've they've got an allocated stock stock management team member um, to kind of look at broach dates um, and audit expiry dates and things like that, and actually empowering that team member to I just don't want to say empower all the time, but it's literally the only word that I've got stuck in my head. <laughs> <laughs> in other words have, in other words have a dispensary dragon that's what you need <laughs> that's how the vmd um used to describe them but, um, yeah, but also in in practice standards and um in the awards but going at, like above and beyond then there are points for having somebody in charge of the dispensary and points and other, also points for having somebody in charge of the controlled drugs and a person deputize if that person's off but um, that reminded me because I wanted to say when uh, when we started talking about audit that another reason that I mean apart from the fact clinical audit is just really interesting and really important anyway it's now in general practice level of practice standards so quite a few practices who maybe haven't actually taken part in it before maybe coming to it via practice standards but we don't need to do it just because of practice standards or we don't need to do it just because it's a bureaucratic exercise. You've got to do it for it to be beneficial to your own practice. That's why it's important to choose something. There's no one size fits all, is there? It's got to be something that's interesting for you. Yeah. And I think once most people can start these processes, you just suddenly realise how beneficial they are. And then it just rolls from there. I mean, it's just finding that initial thing to audit and get everybody on board. And then that's it. Everybody's Everybody will go with it. Um, and finding something that's you know interesting to you i've been involved in kind of audit and quality improvement for a couple of years now but it wasn't until the other week when i went to bvna and saw amanda speak about clinical audit and wound and wound management i thought oh never even thought about auditing <laughs> wound management before <laughs> um so but it's because it's just something that's never never come to my mind and not something that i was actively involved in in practice so it's it wasn't something that i'd thought of um but you really can kind of select well i say select anything um that you're involved in but obviously pam you said before you don't want to pick something that only happens kind of once or twice a year because your audit will just be the longest thing and you'll lose interest before you get any kind of any results mm -hmm. so i used to audit a lot in kind of the kennels and the inpatient area because that's where i spent all of my time was in the kennels and the inpatient area so that's obviously what what we would do um but yeah the wound management audit literally just blew my little mind <laughs> BVNA, yeah, so. and, and we should we should try and involve all our team as well it doesn't just have to be things that we think of as really clinical it can be um things that the, the reception team can get involved in audit just as much and those things can be just as useful i mean they're, they're auditing things like um if estimates are on consent form how much I mean, how much how many complaints does that cause if they're auditing um, whether histories are attached to um, uh, his, histories from, from um, other practices are attached to notes, I mean that might not seem particularly clinical, but it's if that's not there, that's a massive impact on on the vet seeing that animal. Mm -hmm. Client waiting times. There's so many things that. So I think it's really important, like all QI, that it's a whole team activity. Um, I think. And, yeah. Sorry, Pam, I didn't mean to no, no, step over no. you. Um, I was just going to say things can be really topical. I really enjoyed the case example um, that we released this week by Charlotte Thomas, who audited um, consent forms during COVID-19. Obviously, we were all taking animals out of car parks, um, you know, doing pre-op checks in cars um, and auditing pretty much. Well, so many things went out the window um, and it was great to see 
to see someone just be like, you know what, one of these consent forms hasn't been filled out right, this pre-op check hasn't been done right, let's do an audit to see what is being done. Um, and they all admitted that, you know, kind of guidelines and protocols had gone out the window, they were just absolutely maxed out with the stuff to do anyway, they'd just forgotten the things. So they actually designed a better process to make it much easier for them in the mornings and collecting animals from cars was much easier for them. And the fact that that allowed them to adapt into, well, during a horrible time of working anyway, I thought was really cool. I think if COVID's shown as anything, it's that actually how beneficial, even though we're also busy and clinical practice is still very busy, that having those proper systems in place, those workable systems as well, is more important than ever, because this is the time where people are going to be missing things, where things aren't going to be done right. So just being able to even just do a small audit that's just going to improve something will probably just start the ball, ball rolling for it to kind of move into other areas of the practice as well then. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, certainly efficiency, isn't it, is where, um, you know, anywhere we can save time or make our lives easier right now, isn't it? And, um, and with efficiency also comes patient safety, for sure. So it's, it's, um, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, um, I know there's a lot of sort of um, looking at sort of theater efficiency, which quite often reduces general anesthetic time. You know, and, and so, um, so yeah, anything that makes our life easier right now, it's a nice thing yeah. to focus on. Yeah, for sure. And, and asking the team what it is that, that would make life much easier for them, I think, mm -hmm. you know, let, not assuming what it is again, but asking the team what, what could, you know, obviously the biggest issue is probably all the people coming in, but you probably can't do anything about that. But the, you know, what's the next thing that could actually make your life easier? Because mm -hmm. we can save the team, you know, some a few minutes each day. That's just going to be help, really helpful. Yeah, I find that that too is um, during these COVID times that really looking, uh, it's concentrating on the team communicating, uh, getting together, you know, making a plan for the day or making a plan for a surgical case or uh, a patient making a plan for a patient. Any opportunity to get um, people together talking building an understanding of what is our goal or what's going to happen next um, is really helpful, whether that's um, doing case handovers or um, rounds or getting the team huddled up to just talk to each other and what's happening right now and what's going to happen next is really helpful. And, um, and even, even with things like that, it can just be, you know, how do you measure that? Well, could see feedback from the team, you know, are we communicating better now? Um, you know, are, are fewer things falling through the crack cracks? You know, it doesn't always have to be quantitative data. It can be qualitative as well. Mm -hmm. Getting feedback from your team is always really helpful. So it doesn't have to be, you know, this big thing, you know, mm -hmm. it can be, um, you know, small changes, which make big differences. That really reminds me, Angie, that, um, what another thing it doesn't have to be and this is something i can never say it's statistically significant yeah we're not talking yeah. about re we're not talking about research here we're not talking about a big project to find mm -hmm. the best anesthetic for rabbits um uh, or the safest anesthetic for rabbits that would be a research project we're yeah. talking about measuring how what's the outcome of rabbit anesthesia in our practice how many rabbits survive anesthesia that would be an outcome audit or measuring how our team comply with a, a guideline for rabbit anesthesia that would be a process audit we're not talking and, and i think people do sometimes get a little bit sidetracked try and measure too many things at once and to veer towards mm. doing, doing research if they're not careful yeah i think you know keep, keep it small and keep, keep it all about your own practice mm -hmm. definitely i think and and that's the beauty of quality improvement isn't it is that um research take can often take a long time Quality improvement is testing change. It's quick improvements. You know, you can see the benefits um, fairly quickly. Yeah, so it's, yeah. so that's exciting and it's tangible. And it's completely relevant relevant to you. There's there's another great case example we have. Um, I think it I think it was done by Holly in the Knowledge Awards last year. Um, but she wanted to make changes for perioperative hypothermia. So she literally made a change, different change every week. And it was only 
short tests of I'm going to put that in with the patients and then she could see that actually no that's not working so she's going to make another change mm -hmm. and within a month she'd done about five you know four four or five audits but she'd found what worked exactly for her within her practice to make her patients warmer and you know that wasn't a long drawn out process it was just she was smashing out some ideas and completing audits after it and it ended up working out really well mm -hmm. i think sometimes it's that perceived lack of time isn't it i think you make time for what you want to make time for i think is what it comes down to so if you decide you're going to make time to find something that works for you in your practice you'll do it i think yeah it's just having that kind of initial push to do it I suppose isn't it hmm. yeah yeah uh, yeah and, and um often these things will save you time you know if you're reducing your complications or reducing the number of complaints or you know because of the work you're doing um then it oftentimes these things save you time in the long run or reducing the the number of repeat you know patient visits uh you know because you're following a, a guideline or you know better than you were before things like that they can save you time in the long run mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is where i think order can come massively into wound management <laughs> yeah. yeah tell us more about wound, ma wound yeah. management amanda tell us more yeah like i just think there's so many things that we just maybe like my my absolute worst statement that you hear all the time in practices when you warn the owner it's probably going to break down and my question is why then why have we stitched it why why have we closed it if we expect it's going to break down so you know even looking at something like that like could these wounds be managed differently is our triage protocol appropriate are we flushing these wounds when they first come in to reduce bio burden i think there's so many things that you could potentially audit that again could make little changes, just small changes, just a dog comes in, you flush its wound with some tap water and just cover it and pop it in a kennel. So it's not increasing its bio burden, you're not increasing the chance of wound breakdown, increasing the use of antibiotics. It's one of those little things that you could potentially change that actually could have a massive effect for that patient and everybody else. And the time that you then put into managing these wounds that break down, like it takes up a massive amount of team time mm. when you get these big dehiscences and these wounds that you know initially were quite small but then they get closed and you know they get complications so yeah um yeah I just think it's such an untapped area for auditing it's yeah <laughs> definitely and, and it's interesting I think everybody loves a wound I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody in practice who doesn't love a wound. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and that, that's so cool right I mean even just looking at flushing the wound with tap water yeah, uh, yeah, just as an initial, yeah, when you're dealing with everything else, just, mm -hmm. you know, just give it a quick clean. And if you can't get to that dog straight away, you know, the number of stitch ups, I've worked in out of hours for a long period of time now, it's kind of ECC is where I've always sat. And, you know, you get those stitch ups that come in on a Saturday afternoon, and you know, you're not going to get to it for two or three hours, and they just sit there uncovered most of the time, just that bio burden increasing and increasing. So yeah, just that simple change of quickly just giving it a bit of a flush before you put them in that kennel and covering it. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be interesting to see if you looked at you know before you start making that change you know how many wound breakdowns are you having sort of post stitch up when you're closing these kind of yeah. traumatic wounds that we see or even with non-traumatic wounds it's you know how many how many bitch spades are you getting back the owner says it's just got a little lump and it yeah. comes back with a you know a belly full of intestines hanging on the floor yeah. um those sorts of kind of post-op complications and looking at just that can open up Mm -hmm. everything you know are you sending are you sending the patient's home with a buster collar or a t-shirt you know is the owner going to look at the buster collar and say that they'll get the dog to wear it all the time but really not because the dog is going to smack into loads of ankles and <laughs> you know you explaining the importance of kind of the buster collar and, and the t-shirt are you you know are you chatting to owner about what sort of wound prevention would be best for them in their situation and, and for for their animals um, like I used to send loads of cats home with the little onesies because I thought, oh, that's much better for a cat. It's a little onesie. It's 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 going to be great. It won't 
it won't do anything. And then I got my own cat home with a onesie and she literally wouldn't move for about 12 hours. Oh, yeah. That was so awful. I've sent <laughs> yeah. t-shirt paralysis. Mine yeah, I've sent all these patients home with a little onesie because I thought it was the best thing to do when actually the owner's probably at home thinking, well, that's the worst vet nurse in the world. She's given me this onesie. I'm going to take it off immediately because the cat won't move. And, you know, it just opens that conversation with the owners and gets you to look at what you're doing in a more kind of objective way i guess um so sorry slightly going back from my own failings in cat onesies um we did have a question that i think is a great one um aimed for you pam let me just scroll up and find it um is some examples of audits that the client care teams um can do so um the receptionist the guys in the office um so the non-clinical faced audits do we have any kind of tips and ideas where they could get started yeah i think that some of the ones that i, that I mentioned before so um i think um anything around um consent i mean anything around the paperwork obviously um is, is a good work place to start because you can do some nice quick process audits get some results quickly discuss them quickly and and move on so um yeah um estimates on consent forms i think you know uh, is there an estimate there or not that's a nice simple is it there or not um you can you know retrospectively look through you can even go a step back and are the consent forms actually scanned on to the records because how many of them disappear into the ether somewhere between actually being filled in and, and being scanned on and attached to the record um all sorts of uh, con um, off license consent forms for medicines. I know one very, very honest equine practice, bless them, they did um, uh, one about off license consent forms um, with equine vets, and um, they were very honest that their first result was quite near to zero. Um, so, uh, you know, but they had plenty of, plenty of um, potential to improve there. Um, one of the big improvements was to just put the forms in the vets' cars that weren't, that weren't there, and that makes, makes a huge difference. Um, yeah, things around. Um, dispensing of, uh, of medicines checking that you know being a simple medicines audit is it the, the has have they been double signed or is it the right thing in the bag um uh, to waiting to be collected by the owners um those kind of things client waiting times um that we did uh, we did that in my own old practice and oh my goodness it made the vet so competitive <laughs> so you might have heard of this thing called the hawthorne effect which um was uh, we're not sure if it really is real but basically when people are watched they start to improve well people are watched they do sometimes change their behavior i would say and mm -hmm. um, the vets the receptionist it was all it was a receptionist led audit they decided best of practice doing stuff we want to they completely organized it but the vets became so competitive that actually the results were wouldn't, weren't really very accurate of how the situation was before they started but um, but it did cause that you know it improved the situation for clients so yeah that, does it matter why you improve yeah, if it's yeah, competitiveness yeah. then exactly no it yeah. doesn't yeah. and you know we're all very competitive in practice aren't we yeah um, so yeah I think a lot of those type of things I'm sure there's lots of other things and, and getting slightly off the audit um, situation I think it's really important that we're a significant event audits which is not a, a, a quantitative thing it's just about looking at one thing from beginning to end it's really important and the reception team were involved in those massively important in a practice where I locumed um they were like oh we'll just have the vets and nurses and I was like no you need to have the receptionists and then not very long after that they got back to me and said oh we did do it and we did include the receptionist it was all about a cat escaping from on the way between the branch surgery and the main surgery and guess who had the best ideas about how we uh, <laughs> put a protocol in place and went yeah strange that isn't it mm -hmm. or you know even getting back to our rabbit anesthetic if you know if, if you have a disaster with a rabbit anaesthetic, if the receptionists aren't involved, then nobody's going to know that that rabbit was sitting waiting for half an hour because the vet was delayed next to a yapping dog and probably had sky high adrenaline when it went in, which is probably a factor which wouldn't have come out at the, at the meeting if you hadn't had the reception team there too. So I think they're really important. The client care team see everything oh they're, they're like the gurus of the practice <laughs> and, they, and they know which which um which vets where the people come uh, where the clients come out and go i didn't understand the word she said <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know and all that kind of thing 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting, Pam, um, when you mentioned client waiting times, we had a, a mixed practice where, of course, you know, some of the vets were seeing large animals in the morning, but then they would come um, in the afternoon and, um, you know, and see and see some small animal um, patients. And, um, and, and quite often they would get hung up, you know, at the large animal calls. And, um, and so they were looking at, you know, they were having some client complaints regarding waiting times in the afternoon. And so, the, the um, client care team then, you know, looked at those waiting times and when the, you know, the pinch points were happening and, and, the, and the practice ended up tweaking their consulting times, yeah. moving them just a little bit, you know, later, problem solved. Yeah. Well, yeah. That waiting yeah. times is really, um, can be really powerful because you can see where yeah. you might have a perception in your own head of where the busy times are, but you might mm-hmm. find it slightly different. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very good. So I want to be a little bit selfish at this point um, because I want to bring up the Knowledge Awards um, just to let everyone know about them. Um, The Knowledge Awards is, well, our our annual awards for quality improvements. Um, We ask for applications um, for quality improvement initiatives that occur in practice or in education. Um, And then those applications get reviewed um, by a board and we pick uh, kind of quality improvement champions um, year on year. And um, I've mentioned quite a lot of the kind of um, knowledge awards, highly commended runners up or champion case examples, um, because we get so many amazing ideas sent kind of all Oh yeah, um, everyone I kind of pick up and read, I think, oh my God, that's such a good idea. Um, so Angie, what kind of made you, I mean, I think, were you, were you nominated for your award or did you apply yourself? I was nominated for the award. Yes, I was nominated. Yeah. And yeah, and um, which is a nice thing because sometimes people, um, it's interesting when I ask, when I encourage other people to apply and I feel like I was, pub- this was also me, when I, when I was nominated that you don't think it's good enough. Mm. You don't think that your work is good enough. You don't think it's, um, you know, uh, yeah, it's not going to meet the standard. Right. And I'm here to assure you it's good enough. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Um, it's probably, it's, it's always, I mean, amazing, you know, you're, you're not giving yourself enough credit. And so, it, it, what is absolutely the most important thing is that um, we are sharing our experience and we're learning from each other and that's how we progress. So, so I really um, encourage everyone to apply, um, you know, whether you've, you know, you've done one audit, two audits, what, whatever, um, really, you know, and, and, and if you're not quite sure, have somebody look at your application you know, and, and help you. Um, I find that um, people want to help. So, uh, so yeah, so if you're not sure, ask someone, ask for help, but really apply because it's, um, it's a wonderful thing to share your experience with other people. Yeah. I think as a profession, um, we're, we're slight perfectionists. Yep. Um, <laughs> and I, <know. laughs> so, I was being a little bit kind there. <laughs> Yeah, guilty. Yeah. <laughs> we're real control weirdos. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're yeah. slight perfectionists. Um, yes. And I know that especially if, if I was in that situation, I wouldn't want to send in anything that made me look less than perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. actually, when one's come in and I read and they're just like, you know what? We did rubbish. <laughs> like our first <laughs> audit, we didn't do very well. We didn't realize we weren't doing very well. And the mm-hmm. second one, we've made a little improvement, but you know, we're cracking on, we're getting there. Yeah. I think those are my favorites <laughs> because yeah. I'm just like, you know what? You've admitted that you've not done very well. And that's probably because everyone's not doing very well. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't know how well you're doing until you measure yourself and mm-hmm. actually seeing what people do to then get around that and then make the improvements it's yeah. probably my favorite part of the whole thing. Yeah. But you may have, you may think you've not done well, but you have because you've learned something. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So um, to me, that's a win. Yeah. So you've learned, you've learned what hasn't worked. Now you're going to switch. You're going to change paths and you're going to try something else and you're going to learn a lot more. And then that might work. If not change direction again 
and you're every step of the way you're learning and you're improving yeah, so exactly. and that's the goal and your audience is not going to be criticized if you if you, if you i mean it's, it's a quote isn't there um, don't let perfect be the enemy of good you know don't, don't wait for it to be perfect as long as it's good enough um and, and it's, it's not going to be criticized. I mean, and, and some people might might not win, but they might get um, highly commended or something, or they might be one to watch that we've, that they're judges and, and they're, they're, all the applications are blinded, aren't they, Amelia? So the judges don't know whose application mm -hmm. they're looking at them. And, and every, everyone is looked at by how many different people? Three different people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so each application, um, this is where I feel quite privileged because I, I get to read all the applications and then blind them. But basically anything that could identify you as a practice or you as a person or anything um, is redacted out. So, you know, you would read it and not have a clue who it's about or what practice it's about or wh where the application is from. Um, and that's what gets sent to the reviewers. So they genuinely have no idea who the application is from so they judge it basically on kind of what the quality improvement project is um how it's been run how the team have been involved and what the team have learned so again perfection is not part of the not part of the final score at all um and after that once they're kind of unredacted then we let the reviewers and we decide to kind of who the champions are and who the highly commended runners up are that's that's when they finally know who's written the application um, we, go, we didn't know that it was that person oh i never imagined yeah exactly yeah. which is good it, it's really good and it would be great when it have, we were talking about the um front of house team client care team it'd be great to have some applications from there wouldn't they because our winners have been um veterinary nurses and resurgence mm -hmm. and, and people involved in education but i think client care team and also um the thing that would be really great to get some applications around would be sustainability. I mean, yeah. you know, there's a lot of um, uh, measures at the moment to try and reduce waste in veterinary practice, and that's the thing you could very easily audit. And it'd be great to have some applications around that, I think. Yeah, that would be really interesting because the amount of stories you see about practices that are, I don't know, super recyclers and, you know, turning all of their waste into actual good. Um, that would be really good to see as a quality improvement project and just really topical at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we get a lot of applications as well from small animal practices. Um, we've had a couple from equine practices, but it would be amazing to get some more from equine practices um, and also just from farm practices farm as practice. well, because we, well, everyone does quality improvement on a daily basis. You probably just don't even think about think about what you're doing. Um, so next time you're sitting there in surgery with a checklist or before a visit, ticking off your checklist, that's it. You're you're using quality improvement. Um, and that's all the awards is about is people using quality improvement within their everyday setting. And that's what we want to hear about. Absolutely. And we need those case examples because they make it real to everybody else and encourage other people to have a go if they can read proper real case examples. And most of our case examples come from um, award applications, don't they, Amelia? Absolutely, yeah. And they're great for just other people getting ideas ideas from. Um, you know, we get a lot of kind of hypothermia, perioperative um, kind of hypothermia audits. And I'm sure it's because one it's it's easy and two you look at our case examples and there's a lot on there and you think oh yeah that's a good idea and again it doesn't need to be an original an original idea you don't have to come up with something that nobody else has ever done before yeah. um you just i would go on to the case examples and look and just steal someone else's topic idea you know there's no point in <laughs> reinventing the wheel <laughs> to steal an idea and take it we've mentioned loads yeah. of ideas um this evening you know control of drugs wound management um hand washing infection hand washing ones, yeah. um kind of waiting times and things like that there's no point in going into practice and thinking of a whole new idea just steal our ideas it's much easier <laughs> yeah. 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 and you want about the antimicrobial sorry amanda beg your pardon no go on no it's all right <laughs> no i guess and say, so, Andy, what about the antimicrobial resistance things you've been involved in too? Because that's mm. another area, isn't it, where there's plenty of potential for auditing too? Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. I mean, that's a, a world that's ripe for clinical audit, isn't it? It's um, 
you know, we could look at our use of um, highest priority, critically important antibiotics, you know, like our fluoroquinolones and our third generation um, cephalosporins and, and things like that. So, um, and, and sort of when we're using them and, and, and look at, um, is that appropriate use? You know, it's, we, we will always have a use for them, but is it, um, is it appropriate? And, and so, uh, so, so yeah, so looking at the, the use in those and, um, you know, is it, is, is there, is the use guided by cytology or culture and sensitivity? Um, you know, is it, are these things used routinely? We can look at their use in dentals. Um, you could look at their use in, you know, um, sometimes we, or sometimes we use antibiotics in routine surgeries. Is that appropriate? Um, sometimes, sometimes it is depending on length of surgery or, you know, or, um, whatever the circumstance may be, but it, you know, it could be, you know, looking at antibiotic use in certain procedures, certain, um, disease processes, uh, you know, and, and things, so on and so forth. It's whatever you want to focus on. So, so yeah, it's, it's a world that's, that's right for the taking for sure. <laughs> we've, we've got a lot of examples now, um, on ear cytology and antibiotic use, mm -hmm. um, where I think both, both of them have been admitted, um, by vet nurses and they've really empowered their team to, um, kind of take more training on the microscope and cytology and actually identifying um, pathogens. Mm -hmm. And there's a great one by Plymouth Veterinary Group, I think, where they actually increased their cytology, um, reduced the amount of antibiotics they dispense, but also mm -hmm. um, kept kind of the same amount of, of revenue that was coming in. So they'd not lost any money by not prescribing antibiotics and actually they'd built a lot more faith with their clients because they're saying look we're not giving antibiotics because we've looked and there is no pathogens and so they've looked into it a lot more they've explained it a lot better with their clients and you know they're not just having lots of to and froing with a with a dog with sore ears and trying kind of every every drug under the sun really Client engagement is a huge piece in, in AMR, isn't it? It's um, having that conversation with the owner and making them part of the team and, and making those treatment decisions and ensuring that they understand what the consequences are when we use an antibiotic. So, um, so yeah, that's a um, very well said. Yeah, it's a, they're an important part of the team for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I had a practice... Um, sort of a, uh, a bit related, but, but um, totally different clinical audit. They did a red eye clinical audit where they looked at, so they basically, they pulled off their practice management system, um, all of the eye medications that they sold. If the eye medication contained an antibiotic, um, then they looked, okay, and, 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 and said, okay, did we do, did we um, stain the eye, fluorescein stain? Did we make sure that we looked for an ulcer? Um, equally, did we do um, uh, a test for, uh, did we do a Schirmer tear test? Did we do a, a tear test. So, um, so yeah, that was another clinical audit that they That's did. Good yeah, it's really good, isn't it? That one. It's good, yeah. I know, I know. I'm yeah. like, you guys, you guys are good. So if, if so, someone could do that and submit it to the Knowledge Award so I can read it, that would be amazing. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Truly yeah. selfish reasons, but I really want to read that. <laughs> although we're talking about audit tonight, they don't have to be audits for the knowledge awards, do they? It's any kind of QI project. Oh, no, not at all. Um, I mean, a lot of them are audits because I think that's what people are mainly kind of yeah. focused on in practice. Sure. <laughs> um, but any sort of quality improvement um, process is is amazing. Any sort of initiative um, so yeah, even along the sustainability lines, even if you've introduced kind of checklist within practice um, to improve your sustainability, um, then I mean anything along those lines. We've got a great um, ones from the Blue Cross, which is all about guidelines um, yeah, right. of introducing guidelines within the Blue Cross about kind of common treatment um, about treatments for common diseases that got presented, um, and that just made basically the whole team got involved in creating these guidelines it made it much easier for diagnosis to be made and treatment plans to be made because they followed the guideline um and 
yeah that was nothing to do with audits at all all about guidelines but it really was really was a great one and education as well Sam Fontaine up in Glasgow veterinary nurse up in Glasgow that runs the advanced veterinary nursing MSc course um, mm -hmm. with a whole um, a whole section on um, quality improvement and reflective practice and evidence-based medicine she won an award for that last year didn't she and Nottingham University for educating vet students around QI because that's really important too isn't it and something yeah. I'm sure you'll be doing so Amanda in your new role. <laughs> yes, uh, already doing it. We did significant event audits along with complaints <laughs> yeah, on Tuesday. Yeah. So where I'm just gonna go to... <laughs> knowledge yeah. audit application. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Amelia, <laughs> can I can I um, give a little advert for the um for up one new resource that's coming out? Is that okay? Um, you can. We've got four minutes left of oh, our live, um, so we, you certainly it can give it an advert. An absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we had another half an hour. Sorry. Um, yeah, uh, we've got loads of resources about clinical audit. We've got a CPD course. We've got templates, walkthroughs, and we've got all these wonderful case examples we've talked to you about all on the RCBS Knowledge website. But we're coming very soon. <laughs> Amelia and I are involved in this, so coming very, very soon. Very, very soon. Probably within the next few days, if we <laughs> okay. Um, We've got this uh, QI box set. We have a QI box set, which is all about establishing QI in your practice with lots of little podcasts and videos. I've talked to Angie in that, in that one. But the, the one that's coming out now is all about clinical audits. I'm talking to um, award winners like, like Leslie Moore about how she got the team on board, Lou Northway about how she started off and got the team on board, lots of examples and the little podcast you can listen to in the car, there's videos, webinars, articles and all the case examples so um, and of course we call it um, Netflix kind of, it's, <laughs> it's our uh, box set and we had of course we had the idea during lockdown didn't we so um, it's going to get <laughs> even more tacky isn't it Amelia, it's going to get look even more like Netflix eventually. Yes, um, the plan is to really snazz it up um, so it's like a very common streaming service. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> you guys would have all know what we meant anyway. Um, but yeah, the idea is that you can pick up and choose whichever resource you want, but also at the end of the resource, you can just keep streaming and keep strolling um, to your heart's content. So yeah, mm -hmm. and as Pam said, um, a lot of the podcasts and webinars can all be downloaded. So you can listen to them in the car or listen to them on a tea break um, or on your way to work or something like that. Um, and all the documents can be kind of downloaded onto your iPad or can, I don't, uh, no, I don't know how not to say those brand names. Handheld, handheld tablets. Yeah. Handheld tablets. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so that you can kind of read them um, at your leisure. So um, we've been working really hard on that this week. And it. I really hope it will be coming to you next week. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. Um, but it is technology after all. And that's one thing that we can't ever trust. Um, so just know that as soon as it's released you guys will all be the first to know so <laughs> and and these box sets are fab i mean really we're so lucky to have our CVS knowledge bringing this this free cpd is free education to us really yeah. um you know because educating ourselves and becoming sort of fluent in the language of quality improvement is really the first step in implementing quality improvement and so we're so lucky so thank you yeah you know how much CPD we've got, free CPD on quality improvement. Over 70 hours, haven't we, Amelia? Yeah. Um, so the emphasis there. The time, so we can't give you an accurate figure, but more yeah. than 70 hours of completely free CPD. But mm -hmm. the other thing is uh, practices. We'd love, I mean, it's there. It's got to be used. We don't want it to just be there. We want people to use these templates and walkthroughs and all this stuff that's what it's there for but it would be really nice if you could just acknowledge somewhere where it came from because we are a charity and we do all this for free but we'd like to just acknowledge on the documents this came from RCBS knowledge yeah mm -hmm. and everything we produce has got a CPD number on it so you don't really need to count it's got a little quiz at the end for your reflective purposes and um, it's so really easy to put on one CPD afterwards um, and yeah there is so much I mean since I've been involved in creating this and doing it my cpd records for the years have just been off the charts so um and yeah it's all free it's all easily accessible 
Um, and now it's 8 p.m. and we are going to have to sign off because that is the end. I'm just going to put a final call out for any last minute questions, um, not necessarily about clinical audit since it's the last of it. We'll take any questions about quality improvement. Um, and yeah, but it's been really good chatting um, with you three. Thank you so much for joining me in the sheep field um, for this Facebook <laughs> Thank Live. For Thank you for having us. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. It's yeah. fun. Yeah, and it's it's really been lovely. And this will be um recorded. So if you are watching it at a later date and you think, oh, I wish they would have answered that, or I wish I could have watched it live to answer that question, just comment and you know, whatever questions you comment or email in, um, we'll get back to kind of the four of us and we'll come up with um an answer for you and get back to you. So yeah, that's it. Um yeah, thanks everyone for attending and thanks for your comments. So we, well, we'll say goodbye. Yeah, goodbye, thank you. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.